This is a big red button, wired up to seven actual rocket emojis that are primed and ready for launch. Where they ignite, we'll know once and for all what is the best tech company in the world, or at least which is the best at designing emoji rockets. This whole insane video idea came to me when I realized that the rockets we see in social media don't look anything like the ones that actually go to space, and I wanted to find out why. In addition to 3D printing and designing these rockets, I also went to a chemistry lab and two types of wind tunnel to get a crash course in rocket science. Obviously, don't try anything you're about to see me do at home. Not only did I have to go through half an hour of safety training, but I'm also wearing safety glasses. Before we look at aerodynamics or fancy stability, we first need to get our rocket off the ground. We do that using rocket fuel. There are a few different types we could use, but for today, I'm using solid propellant, since it's relatively cheap and I can access it without being put on a government watch list. To see how rocket fuel works, I've submerged one of our engines into this graduated cylinder and filled it with water. When I press this button, current from the battery should flow through the wire and into an electronic match, which, when it ignites, will set off the black powder mixture inside the engine, producing a huge amount of carbon dioxide, nitrogen gas, and potassium sulfide. On three then. Three, two, one. Wow, that is a lot of gas. Actually, far more than I was expecting. We flooded the table and now the entire room smells of rotten eggs. Let's head somewhere else to explain why we needed all of that exhaust. It's this exhaust which makes the rocket move, according to the impulse equation. Using the equation, we know if we want to increase the power of our rocket, we could increase the amount of gas being produced per unit time, or by making the velocity of that gas really fast. Rocket emojis are typically quite round. This is good because it means we can fit more fuel in there, allowing it to reach higher heights, but the comically large portholes suggest that not all of the space is actually put towards fuel. In Wallace and Gromit's A Grand Day Out, we see that they fit an entire living room inside their rocket, leaving pretty much no room for fuel at all. Even without much fuel, we can still get pretty good thrust by increasing the velocity of those exhaust gases. To see how we do that, let's take a cross section of one of our rocket engines. Here we have the black powder charge. Over here we would in theory have some sort of cap, although when I cut it in half the cap sort of fell out. And encasing it we have a cardboard tube. This bottom end, where all the exhaust gases are going to be forced out, we have a plug, but with a very small hole in the middle. Like with a hose pipe, if we restrict the flow by partially plugging it with a finger, or adding in a clay throat piece, then we increase the speed of that escaping gas. Roughly speaking, the same amount of fluid comes out, the only thing changing is its velocity. We can keep making throat diameter tighter and tighter until eventually the exhaust gases are traveling at the local speed of sound. If we were to make the throat even tighter still, then they'd still be exiting at the speed of sound, but there'd just be less of them. The reason I talk about the local speed limit is because this value changes based on local density as well as temperature. In the high pressure, super high temperature exhaust gases of a rocket, this means that the speed of sound actually increases to 900 meters per second. In freedom units of going to the moon, that is equivalent to about 2,000 miles per hour. At the moment, our exhaust gases are under extremely high pressure and are also pretty hot. However, this isn't very good at moving our rocket forward. So to do that, we need to increase the speed and can get rid of these other unimportant factors. We do that by having an expanding bell nozzle at the back of the rocket. What this does is it forcibly expands the exhaust, reducing the pressure and the temperature while increasing speed. With this technique, the exhaust gases coming out of the SpaceX's Merlin engine can achieve an exit speed of more than 3,000 meters per second, but with an exit pressure of only about 0.6 bar. In theory, the most efficient engine is one that has an exit pressure equal to the ambient pressure. From what we can see of our rocket emojis, we can tell that some designers have elected to include both the converging and diverging components of the nozzle, others have just done the converging, and some have no nozzle at all. Because of this, we're going to have two separate launches. 
In the first, every one is being powered by a D motor. This is the highest power engine that I can access in Perth. The next launch, we're going to account for the different types of nozzle and give some, which have a really good nozzle, the more powerful D motor, and others, which have a bit of the nozzle, the less powerful C, and some, which have no nozzle at all, the least powerful B motor. First though, we need to be sure that these rockets are actually going to fly. And for that, we need wind tunnel number one. This is Shui, an actual high-powered rocket built by one of my friends. She's launched in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. On the other hand, Mr. Spotty is a PVC pipe with delusions of grandeur. He also doesn't have any fins. We're in the wind tunnel to find out if that makes a difference. The first thing we need to consider is center of mass. We can find it experimentally on the rod by having your fingers at either end and then moving them in towards the middle until the entire rod balances on a single finger. You can think of it as the entire object's mass is acting through this point. We also have a center of mass on Shui and Mr. Spotty. I've balanced the rockets on this center of mass and included a pivot joint. This allows them to rotate freely as the air moves them left and right. Next, we need to consider the center of pressure. If we were to consider just a 2D cross section of the rocket and hold it against the wind, the center of pressure is the point at which the total sum of pressure field acts on the body, causing a force to act through that point. Roughly speaking, the surface area in front of the center of pressure equals the surface area behind the center of pressure. Mr. Spotty has a center of pressure much further forward than its center of mass. Shui's fins, on the other hand, have pulled its center of pressure much further back. To see what difference that makes, let's turn on the wind tunnel. Now that we have the wind tunnel up to speed, we can see how Shui operates in the wind. Because we have the center of mass ahead of the center of pressure, even if it deviates one way, then because the wind is pushing on that center of pressure, we have a sort of torque being formed, which pushes the entire thing back into alignment. On the other hand, this is Spotty's sense of pressure. It's much further ahead than its sense of mass. This means that the wind just spins it around. There is a restorative tool, but it's really pushing the other way. It's incredibly unstable. From these tests, we can conclude that a safe rocket is one with the sense of mass ahead of the sense of pressure. Okay, Vlad, let's shut it down. In addition to these factors, a large diameter makes it harder for the restorative torque to push the structure back into alignment. Using a mathematical description of stability, center of mass minus center of pressure over diameter, we can rank the emojis. For reference, Shui has a stability of 1.9, which is roughly an order of magnitude better than the emojis, although at least the center of pressure and mass are the right way around. Given their relatively poor stability, when they launch, get ready for a few of these emojis to just start spinning. For those that do manage to survive, we have one final topic to cover in a wind tunnel that doesn't use wind. In order to quantitatively compare the aerodynamics for each of our rockets, we need to perform some sort of test. When they leave the launch rail, the rocket should be traveling at about 50 meters per second. This is way too fast to simulate in the eight meters per second speed limit of the tunnel from earlier. So I got thinking, what about rather than using the low density, low viscosity, but very fast air in a wind tunnel, instead we use something much more viscous, a lot more dense, and made it go a little bit slower. Perhaps we could put our rocket inside this medium and pull it up, measuring the drag experience when it does so. But what could we use? Well, water's been used before, but that's a bit boring. Perhaps we could use golden syrup. Let's give it a shot. Here's how to construct your very own wind tunnel that doesn't use wind. I've looped a piece of string around some pulleys. Onto one end, we have a constant mass, namely a pancake flipper. And on the other end, we have a mini version of one of our rockets. This is the Microsoft emoji. All we need to do now is fill up our two liter graduated cylinder with golden syrup, and we're good to let the experiment begin. In what is sure to become the next big spectator sport, we have Microsoft versus Twitter. As you can see, Twitter's low profile and streamlined sides give it the least drag. 
allowing her to zip past Microsoft at a truly demanding pace. With a bit of fluid dynamics, we can convert our data into useful drag statistics. However, rather than repeating what is the stickiest experiment I've ever been involved in, I'm going to use a dedicated simulation package designed for just this sort of fluid flow problem. Apple, with its large fins and bulbous body, has the highest drag, while shark-like Twitter has the lowest. Now that we have the theory, let's put it into practice. We're back at the launch range. On launchpad number one, we have our search engine emojis, Mozilla and Google. Of all the emojis, Mozilla has the equal worst nozzle design, while Google tied for best. Its converging and diverging sections will allow its exhaust to go supersonic. For the first launch, all of the rockets are using the same D-Class engine. Now, none of the rockets have parachutes attached, so I'm not sure how many will survive, but for those that do, we're going to have a second launch, where we take into account for the differences in nozzles. On Launchpad 2, we have our social media emojis, Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp. Facebook looks like the quintessential rocket, and my dad has already dipsed it to go on his piano once we're done filming. The remaining six, however, I'll be randomly sending out to new subscribers and anyone who comments on the video. I had to make some interesting design choices with Twitter. The 2D emoji looked a lot more like old Betty from Futurama than the more rotationally symmetric rocket in Wallace and Gromit. So I represented this with a flattened profile. Twitter has a really low drag coefficient, although I expect it will spin wildly out of control because of its unbalanced design. On Launchpad 3, we have the operating systems, Apple and Microsoft. Coincidentally, Apple has the highest stability of all the rockets, and Microsoft has the worst. It's the most likely to crash. After an insane amount of preparation, the rockets are primed and ready to go. Three, two, one. First to leave the pad is WhatsApp, closely followed by Apple and Twitter. Then comes Microsoft. Emerging from the smoke, we see Facebook, Google, and finally Mozilla. Long launch rails ensure that the rockets get off the pad going pretty straight. However, soon many of them turn or spin wildly out of control. As you can see, Mozilla, WhatsApp, and Apple have taken out the top three spots. So that was pretty exciting, and we only damaged a few of the rockets. In fact, I think we can super glue this back together and be ready for another launch. So on that first launch, everyone was going on a D motor. It's the most powerful and looks really cool, but doesn't take into account different nozzle designs. For that, on our second launch, I'm going to have three different engines. With the new engines loaded, it's time for launch number two. Hopefully with a little bit less thrust, a few of them can be a bit more stable. On three then. Three, two, one. WhatsApp and Google still go pretty well. They stayed on the D, so that does make sense. Expectedly, the Cs and Bs go a little bit worse, although Twitter's decent design allows it to go quite high. Plotting the results, we see that more thrust makes the rocket go higher. Considering just the data from the first launch, we see that better stability generally results in a higher apogee. That makes sense. A rocket that doesn't spend half the flight doing the loop-the-loops is probably going to go higher than one that does. 
our drag results are a bit more confusing. They suggest that the more drag that you have, the higher you can go. Rather than fundamentally rewriting all of rocket science, I think this is actually just illustrating that other factors have had more of an influence. You could have the most streamlined rocket ever designed, but if it's not pointing the right direction, then that doesn't really matter. Unfortunately, Mozilla wasn't able to make it to a second launch. However, given that it was on the lowest power beam motor, we can be confident that it wouldn't have gotten very far. For these reasons, I'm declaring WhatsApp as the creators of the world's best rocket emoji. So does that mean that WhatsApp is going to be replacing SpaceX's Starship for the next moon landing? Maybe. But to be serious, there is a reason why we have graphic designers design emojis and rocket scientists design rockets. For our final launch of the day, we have WhatsApp versus an actual model rocket. Until next time, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. This video could not have been made without the huge amount of support from the folks at the University of West Australia, as well as members from the UWA Aerospace Rocket Team. In particular, I'd like to thank Thomas who did all our 3D printing, the lab technicians who let us mess around with their laboratories, and of course to Adam for the chemicals and general lab equipment. I'd also like to thank our patrons, without whom we could not have afforded to make such a really ridiculous video. And if you made it to this point, you may want to jump over to the Discord server where we discuss the videos, talk about rocketry stuff, and uh, generally have quite a fun time. Uh, see you then.